Listen, let's start uh, with the budget, uh, right? Less than 24 hours ago, you were standing there in Parliament for almost two hours on your feet delivering this budget. It is only your second one, if I'm not mistaken. And a lot of people observing and watching you were going like, this guy looks like he's been doing it his entire life. Well, this is not an easy task. How, how do you feel? It is challenging. Uh, it's particularly challenging this year because it really was a very delicate balancing act to manage due to the different competing demands and pressures. On the one hand, we had to try and get our fiscal position to a more sustainable one, especially after spending so much during COVID. But yet we can't taper down too quickly because the economy is still weak and you know we don't want to make things worse yeah. and because of inflation many people want help with cost of living pressures yeah. and yet at the same time if you do too much on cost of living you may inadvertently push up inflation and fuel demand so how do you find the sweet spot yeah. so this was what we this was a challenge we faced trying to put all these together and finding the sweet, sweet spot in this budget. And I think in the end, we've tried to do that by tapering it down. Um, it's, it's still a deficit, but much smaller, yeah. and focusing our spending on groups that really need them. Okay. So we had to prioritize, looking at economic competitiveness, helping families in particular, and then the lower income groups. Okay, which, which we'll break, break down, down and get into in just a little bit. But uh, I know it's just been a couple hours yet, but what sort of reaction or feedback have you had from either people, citizens, or, or even businesses, whether the local companies or, or MNCs to the budget? Well, the initial reaction tends to be focused on the headline items. So I think families are happy with the, all the family-friendly uh, measures. Uh, the Singaporeans, I think, are responding well to the cost of living support measures, particularly for the lower and middle income groups. And we've got also some positive responses from businesses, particularly with regard to the um, innovation measures that we are providing in the budget. So uh, if we could take a step back, I mean, the backstory to this latest budget is obviously Singapore, like most other nations around the world or governments around the world, have had no choice, have been forced to spend and spend big, including in Singapore's case, digging into your fabled strategic reserves to try and get the country, its people, its companies, etc., over COVID as well as its aftermath, the inflationary shocks, supply chain shocks. Obviously, today, as we speak, things are much better. Uh, yes, we're talking with masks off, China has just uh, reopened, etc., and things are generally recovering. So this latest budget, uh, in monetary terms, what is it an enabler for Singapore and the government to do? What is it meant to do now? The you know, we talked about the reserves and us using the reserves. We did it the last time around when the global financial crisis hit us in 2008. We used the reserves then, but our economy rebounded very quickly at that time. Our fiscal position was strong and we were able to pay back the reserves two years later. This time it's different. Our economy has recovered back to pre-COVID levels, but our fiscal position is still quite weak and it is still very tight. And that's why we are very unlikely to be able to put back the reserve that we had drawn for this COVID-19 crisis. Yeah. Um, but given that context, given the very tight fiscal context, we have to prioritize. And the measures in the budget are really meant to better position Singapore, our economy and our society for a future that we think will be more uncertain, mm -hmm. a world that will be more troubled. Uh, in Parliament yesterday, you described Singapore's uh, fiscal position as, as tight. Explain, what does that mean? You were saying that you're forecasting a very, very small deficit, although still a deficit of 0.1% of GDP. When are you expecting uh, uh, or hoping to achieve a balanced uh, budget? That's one. And two, a lot of people are looking at this and going, look, uh, it's admirable that you've been able to, to write the finances this way so to the point where the deficit just, is just so slim, marginal, right? But looking ahead to 2025 when elections need to be called, they have to be called by then, that's going to be tough. I mean, that doesn't leave much leeway, does it? <laughs> leeway for what? For, for spending. spending. <laughs> well, we have to live within our means. Yeah. That's a principle we will never compromise. So we will continue to uphold fiscal prudence. Uh, I think it's 
a question of how we can guide our fiscal position back to a balanced one. Mm. Uh, we are, it, it has to also be appropriate for the economic conditions, obviously. So obviously, if the economy remains weak, then we can't get back to a balanced position so quickly, and we have to make sure that the fiscal stance um, is appropriate and suited for the economic conditions at that time. This year, I think we are roughly at a neutral position. It's a very small deficit, but it's neutral. Sure. I think it's appropriate for the economy now. Okay. Uh, of course, things can go wrong. We think that the risks are weighted on the downside, in fact. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding optimism about COVID being where it is now and China reopening, I think there are considerable downside risks. And so we are also making sure that we have drawer plans in, rate in place should some of these downside risks materialize. But beyond this year, next year, the year after, I think we'll have to wait and see and assess how economic conditions are and then uh, manage our fiscal position accordingly. What would be the number one downside risk for Singapore and its economy in your mind? There are a few. The strength of the global economy, particularly the U.S. economy, that's one. I think most economists think that it would be okay in the U.S. economy now, um, this year. And even if there is a contraction, it will be relatively mild. But who knows? It can get worse. And then the, U the war in Ukraine, that's, um, the conflict can escalate and there can be more shocks to the global economy and to global supply chains. Mm -hmm. COVID is another. I mean, we think it's moved to a new phase, when but you, know? you never know. Yeah. Jeez. Okay. Now, in Parliament yesterday, uh, delivering your uh, budget speech, you also uh, talked about uh, how right now geopolitics is being very much influencing economic decisions, right? And you referred to uh, a zero-sum game where basically it's either uh, I win or you lose. Mm -hmm. It's either us or them or us uh, and our friends and them and their friends, right? So, and you referred to uh, Singapore as a little red dot. Mm -hmm. This has been used before, all right? Uh, and how it is going to manage its way through in an increasingly hostile uh, world. What is the game plan? Well, we are, we are a small country. We have to take the world as it is and not what we would like it to be. So I think the game plan is really just to get back to basics. Be very clear what our interests are and advance those interests in a credible and principled manner consistently so people know where we stand and at the same time continue to be friends with all countries, with the key superpowers which we have very close relationships with and um, our partners in ASEAN and the wider region and continue to work with like-minded countries to strengthen multilateralism mm -hmm. as opposed to a uh, move toward economic nationalism which is happening, which we see happening. So to strengthen a rules-based multilateral system. And then finally, to really build on our fundamentals because I think our fundamentals are strong the Singapore brand is highly regarded for our honesty, integrity, reliability. Investors trust us. They have confidence in us, which is why even amidst these turbulence and shifts that we are seeing around the world, we are continuing to see healthy flows of investments, capital Indeed. and talent. And, and we uh, should make full use of these opportunities. Indeed. I think the latest evidence of that is uh, FDI uh, commitments for last year, I think 22, over $22 billion. That's a, that's a record number. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's, uh, we've been talking at about 30,000 feet. Let's bring it down to, to ground level now. And inflation, still an ongoing worry, maybe less so, but still a worry, right? Um, what sort of sense do you get? How are your people and also local companies as well as MNCs uh, operating in Singapore, how are they managing, how are they dealing with it? Well, for Singaporeans, it is a concern because while we have tried our best to manage imported inflation with exchange rates and other measures, the headline inflation is still higher than what many people are used to. So it is a concern, which is why we are doing whatever we can with cost of living support measures, but rather than do it across the board, which may inadvertently fuel additional demand and make things worse, we are targeting the lower and middle income groups to some extent. And so for low income Singaporeans and households, 
the, the message is the support measures that we have provided to them this year will be enough to cover the increase in spending that they face due to inflation and the GSD rate increase mm -hmm. entirely. So, which is uh, good for them, uh, right? For uh, the rest of the populace, though, including expatriates, foreign workers, etc., what are they to make of uh, some of the line items in the, the budget with regards to property taxes and also car taxes? Um, Singapore may not be the most expensive uh, place in the world to live, but it is getting up there. And the recent change is certainly not the cheapest, right? Uh, we, we probably yeah. cannot, we can never be the cheapest. Yeah. And you shouldn't compete on that basis either, right? Uh, but the two biggest ticket items for most people, right, are a roof over your head as well as, and the other one is basically not a necessity but more a nice to have, which is transportation, a car, right? Singapore is already the most expensive place in the world to own a car, and it's gotten even more so. How potentially does that affect Singapore's competitiveness when it intends to and wants to attract more foreign talent? For car taxes, we've only increased it for very expensive cars, the luxury cars. The cars with an open market value of 40000 and below are not impacted. We are targeting luxury cars. You don't need a luxury car to get around, but if you want to buy a Ferrari or a Lamborghini in Singapore, good for you. But, but it will cost, cost you. you. Pay the taxes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Uh, let, let's move on and talk about whether or not Singapore needs to at this stage um, reinvent itself. You talked uh, during the budget about uh, where you want to uh, prioritize in terms of uh, growth sectors, right? As a financial hub, obviously, mm -hmm. it's already known and has been known for some time as the Switzerland uh, of Asia. Uh, biomed, uh, manufacturing, high-end, uh, uh, electronics, uh, etc. Uh, what is the approach you are going to take to attract more investment in all of these sectors and grow them to create more jobs, higher incomes, etc. for people here? We will continue the, you know, to, to engage the multinational enterprises um, and focus on these key areas where we have competitive advantages. M manufacturing, we have key segments like electronics, chemicals, biomedical science. We've got transport and logistics anchored by our air and sea hubs, uh, seaports, very strong, and financial services. We can't do everything. It's impossible, given our size, the size of our economy. So, focus on so we have to focus on our strengths, build deeper capabilities, and make sure that when MNEs, the multinational enterprises, come into Singapore, they set up best-in-class facilities, which will, in turn, help strengthen our capabilities, benefit our local ecosystem, and really, at the end of the day, benefit Singaporeans. Is this, Is this going to change uh, Singapore's role in the global supply chain or, or rather emphasize it? We you hope we will continue to be a key node, in fact a more important node in global supply chains. I think the way the world is going, people, companies are talking about reshoring, onshoring, nearshoring, uh, shifts are taking place, but however these shifts take place, there will be a supply chain and we want to be a key note in that supply chain. I want to move on. We've talked about uh, foreign direct investment, so this is fixed hard investment in factories and plants and things like that. The other thing that Singapore is attracting in, uh, in abundance is, of course, uh, portfolio capital, mm -hmm. uh, wealth, money from abroad, especially from China, people have uh, noted. Uh, possibly because of the situation there during the lockdown. Uh, there could be other reasons as well, but you know, people take a look at the number of family offices set up in Singapore. Close to half of them mm -hmm. belong to or were started by uh, Chinese citizens who are either were Chinese or have applied to and uh, received uh, permanent residency or even become citizens, which is on the one hand all to the good, but there are potential implications for inflation. You know, I know a lot of, there's a lot of local grumbling. People here are going, ah, these guys, they drive up the cost of uh, uh, apartments and houses. They make rents more expensive. And my God, look at the cars they buy. Yeah. How do you handle that situation? Because, because it affects, affects social, social tensions as does, well. It does, it does. And, and uh, you know, we think that where we are today in the world, it's, it's a good thing because the Singapore brand is strong. We are attracting capital flows. And we are very clear that when we bring in these flows, it must benefit Singapore and Singaporeans. 
Uh, it must benefit our financial ecosystem. It must create more opportunities for Singaporeans. So that's a plus. But these flows do bring with it its share of challenges. Mm -hmm. On the property market, we have ways to address that. We have a whole range of measures to manage the property market prices to make sure that prices move in line with fundamentals. And we will continue to monitor that closely. It will have impact also on society at large mm -hmm. because of you know, displays of wealth, because of social impact on social norms, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. All right, so we, 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 our message is very clear to people coming into Singapore that we welcome you, but you have to fit into our society. Singapore works because we are an inclusive society where the better off will contribute more to society and should, and should do so. Yeah. And it works because we maintain an informal and egalitarian tone in our society where people can interact freely and comfortably with one another as equals. And we want to ensure that remains. We want to make sure that the character and tone of our society remains. So our message is very clear. Uh, we welcome you to our house, but please respect our house rules. Okay, fair fair enough. enough, yeah. Deputy Prime Minister, one last question before we let you go. We've taken up a lot of your time, and I know you're a very busy man. Um, <clears throat> geopolitics, right? In the news recently, uh, aside from uh, GPT, of course, uh, <clears throat> balloons in the U.S. Are they weather balloons? Are they surveillance balloons? Balloons over Latin America. Uh, Chinese Coast Guard uh, cutters firing laser weapons on fishing boats in the Philippines. What is going on and how do you read this whole ongoing and potentially escalating conflict between the U.S. and China? Well, we watch with great concern. Uh, it was a good thing la uh, earlier that President Xi and President Biden had met in Bali and they had wanted to start a process of engagement and dialogue between both sides. And, and that started. Janet Yellen met with Liu He at Davos in mm. WEF. And we were hoping that Blinken, could, the State Secretary, could visit China uh, and, and continue that momentum of dialogue. Yes, Unfortunately, this has been re derailed recently because of all the recent incidents. Oh, so postponed. postponed. And uh, we, we hope that at some point in time, the both sides can, can resume that engagement because it's so important for the two superpowers to have that ability to work together. If both sides move towards a second Cold War, mm -hmm. the consequences will be huge. I mean, it's not the same as the first Cold War, given how much more integrated China is with the global economy. It will be devastating for all of us.